Before we move on, I just want to say one thing which is kind of the elephant in the room. So Unsafe Space is a campus tour. The idea being that we're going to, I feel like I'm whistling a little bit. <laughs> Maybe if you shift a bit, a bit this way. Let yeah. me move up a little bit. If that happens again, let me know. Um, so I'll just project. But. So the idea of the, of the campus tour was really to try and get beyond what I think we might recognise as the kind of pantomime, the kind of farce that has sort of engulfed the free speech debate, particularly over the past year, to really try and create a opposition to this new censorship, to this new authoritarianism, but to do in a way that is trying to cast more light than heat. Um, now, the reason, as you might notice, that we're not on a campus right now is that that's actually quite a difficult thing to do Ooh, these days. I'm going to keep the volume down. Um, and so, of course, as many of you, I'm sure, will be aware, this um, panel was originally supposed to be at American University in an auditorium, but unfortunately, um, due to various reasons that I won't go into too much, the room that we had booked for a very long time, all signed off, was cancelled at the last minute. Um, and so we've had to very quickly rearrange here. I'm not going to relitigate that too much, but all I'll say, it's a bit of a shame that the first stop on the Unsafe Space Tour turned out to be too unsafe for American <laughs> University. But nevertheless, on that, I want to say a big thank you to Anne-Marie Rienzi from Young Americans for Liberty, who not only organised a great event at American University, but also helped us put it back together um, to bring it here. And of course, to Elizabeth Nolan Brown and everyone at Reason for taking us in, the little waifs and strays that we are, um, to make sure that we could go ahead with this debate tonight. So thank you very much all for that. So first of all, let's get on to the topic itself. So Title IX. So on the face of it, Title IX seems like the most un uncontroversial thing imaginable. A federal statute which um, outlaws sexist discrimination in public funded institutions. Yet, over the years, it's something which has expanded, kind of mutated, moved from being something very distinct to something which is seemingly mandating campus sexual assault proceedings, for instance, and, some, and definitions of sexual harassment which seem to expand to such an extent that someone like Laura Kipnis, a feminist academic at Northwestern University, is submitted to a Title IX investigation for criticising Title IX. So that's something that we really want to look at. This is a very contentious debate, a lot of um, hard arguments on either side between wanting to protect women on campus, but on the other side feeling that this goes too far, that it's whipping up something resembling a hysteria. And of course, a couple of weeks ago, the announcement from Betsy DeVos, the Education Secretary, that she was indeed going to rein it in has only really poured gasoline on that fire. So partly this discussion is whether or not that reining in is a good thing for students' rights on campus, for free speech on campus, for women and men on campus. But also I hope to kind of dig down a little bit deeper into the cultural and political trends that have brought us to this point. Title IX at the end of the day is only a piece of paper. Why has it grown? Why has it mutated? What does that say about what we think about campus life and, and students and women and men together on campus nowadays that has led it to this point? So I'm delighted to be joined by a really fantastic panel, an expert panel, to discuss this. You might be noticing that we're actually one short, uh, because unfortunately Dean Strossen, um, former president of the ACLU, civil libertarian author, a bit of a hero of spikes, unfortunately couldn't be here. She was taken ill yesterday and is actually in hospital. She's absolutely fine. Um, it's just a bit of exhaustion, um, and she's absolutely gutted that she can't be here tonight. But in the midst of what is usually a very hectic schedule, um, she's taking some well-earned rest. So that while we miss her, we're going to carry on regardless. Um, so I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order in which they'll speak. Um, and then after that, they'll speak for about five minutes. We'll have some discussion up here on the panel, and as soon as possible, we'll kick it out to you guys for some more points, questions, and some more discussion. So, speaking first, in the middle there is Robert Shibley. Robert is the Associate Director of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Um, he's worked on hundreds of cases with students and academics and faculty on free speech cases, on, on due process cases. And most pertinently for tonight, he's the author of a fantastic book, Twisting Title IX, which is a bit of a history as well as kind of expose in some respects on the, um, on the Title IX phenomenon and its excesses. So it's fantastic to have Robert here. Speaking after Robert on my immediate left is Ella Whelan. Ella Whelan is Spike's assistant editor. Um, she's the coordinator of our free speech university rankings, which is our fire style uh, campus censorship league table in the UK. Um, and she's also the author of a brand new book, um, What Women Want, Fun, Freedom and an End to Feminism, which is a polemical, fascinating, um, and a kind of call to arms really um, for a new women's liberation movement that leaves behind the authoritarian turn of feminism. So please do pick that up. 
And finally, on the far left there is Elizabeth Nolan Brown, of course, of Reason, associate editor here, um, writes about public policy, culture, current affairs from a libertarian and feminist perspective. It's written for everyone from Politico, LA Times, Fox News, um, you name it. And it's fantastic to have, us here, have her here as well. Um, so each of the panelists is going to speak for about five minutes. As soon as possible, we're going to kick it out to you guys. As I'm sure you've noticed, many on the panel are of a similar critical type view. And one of the shames of not being able to hold this at American University is a lot of the students we knew who were coming, who were coming to criticise and to make their points across, now don't have that opportunity. I do hope that some have made it across because we didn't want to trade one echo chamber for another. But nevertheless, I'm sure it's going to be a great discussion. So, Robert, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Generous introduction, and I'm glad uh, we were able to be here. Um, and thank you to, to Spike and certainly to Reason for stepping up uh, at the last minute like that. We really appreciate it. Um, since uh, since I'm going first, let me give a little bit of a very abbreviated and probably um, you know overly simplified history of Title IX and how we got here. Um, and one thing I should start out with is when you when you talk about Title IX. Uh, generally speaking, people think of it uh, in athletics um, has generally been the history of it. And in fact, uh, when it was uh, put into place in uh, 1972, that was actually one of the main concerns was the, the, the low level of women's participation in college sports. And um, you know, from that perspective, um, Title IX has actually been a really smashing success. By about, I, I saw a graph, uh, I talk about it in my book, um, by 1985, the, the representation of women in college sports had, had shot up so much and it really hasn't moved a lot since. So, um, you know, in that fairly short span of years, um, you know, we really got to the representation level we have now. Um, so when it comes to athletics, you know, Title IX, uh, there's still controversy, obviously, uh, that has to do with it, but um, that part of the controversy doesn't have a lot to do with what we're here today uh, to talk about. What Title IX says, Title IX, it's a pretty short law um, and the, uh, the part of it that is actually um, operational uh, is, is, I think, 29 words, and these are the words. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity of receiving federal financial assistance. Um, that uh, sort of makes it sound like it only applies to public schools. It does not because federal uh, financial assistance includes uh, just about every government grant, obviously, you get, and also Pell Grants and Stafford loans. Uh, so there are, there are only a handful of schools in the country, uh, all private schools, uh, to which Title IX uh, does not apply. So it, it, for all practical purposes, it applies at every school in the country. Um, it wasn't long after its passage that uh, feminist scholars uh, realized that Title IX could be used for more than athletics and uh, another big uh, aspect of it was that um, it started to, uh, it, it was a big part of the reason that we don't have so many single sex colleges anymore. It, it started to really close the door on the ability uh, to run uh, single sex higher education uh, programs easily. Um, and uh, the most uh, the most prominent is somebody who is, is known to anybody who knows anything about feminism, Catherine McKinnon, um, who uh, as a student um, and an early on, um, you know, sort of advocate of this sort of thing, um, pushed at Yale uh, for uh, people to bring a case that would start to use Title IX um, as a way to address sexual harassment um, on campuses. Uh, the idea being that Title IX bans sex discrimination. That's the words it uses. Um, it wasn't clearly established at the time, although it was an idea that was out there. It wasn't clearly established yet that sexual harassment was a form of discrimination. Um, but uh, through a uh, through a case, um, Alexander v. Yale in 1977, even though it was a it was a loss in court, uh, they weren't able to demonstrate any sexual harassment had taken place. They were able to establish the principle that sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination under Title IX. Um, since then, uh, as Tom was talking about, it has expanded from there um, because. There are a lot of different uh, sort of categories of things you can put into uh, the, the rubric of sex discrimination. Uh, you can um, add in uh, things like, obviously, sexual harassment. Sexual assault is now considered to be part of, um, part of it because it is considered to be, interestingly enough, rather it's not in there because it's a crime, 
Um, it's in there because it is considered to be an extremely severe form of sexual harassment and therefore a form of sexual discrimination. That's, that's the reach that Title IX um, has onto it. Um, we're also seeing it being read into um, issues of gender um, and uh, you know, to the extent that sex and gender are not uh, coterminous, which is not a debate we need to get into, uh, you know, there's, there's also you know, debate over you know, to what extent did the authors of Title IX or, or should Title IX be interpreted to cover uh, gender identity as opposed to uh, just sex. Uh, so there's a lot of different complicated things. Um, and the Obama administration uh, made what FIRE thinks was a, a bad decision back in uh, 2011. On April 4th, uh, they released this, this now sort of infamous Dear Colleague letter, um, which has the most boring title possible, um, but it was actually very exciting in a bad way uh, for both FIRE and for civil libertarians and for colleges and universities. Uh, it was uh, the administration's attempt to uh, add a, what we think and, and what I think, you know, I think we're right on this, was a new interpretation um, of Title IX and um, basically saying that the law required, in order for you to be compliant with the law, uh, if you were going to have, you needed to have um, campus tribunals to determine whether or not sexual assault or sexual misconduct could happen. And those tribunals, whatever they are, and they could be a single investigator, they could basically be an inquisitor. Um, and I, I'm trying to, I'm using that in a non pejorative way. There's a reason it has a pejorative term, and I'm sure we'll get into that. Uh, it has a connotation of that. Um, you need to use the preponderance of the evidence standard, which is this 50.01%. You know, um, there's a lot of different ways of putting it, you know, 50% uh, plus a feather. Basically, how certain do you have to be that it happened? You have to be, in order to just declare somebody responsible for sexual misconduct, 50% 50, 50 sure plus a tiny, tiny bit. Um, a lot of schools were already using that. Uh, some were not. Um, and. Uh, it, it was, it was a, uh, a new regulation, uh, effectively, from the government that said, all right, you know what, now all schools have to use it to be compliant with Title IX. They also discouraged cross-examination, um, and you know, particularly of the direct kind. Um, and, and there's some understanding for that. Obviously, when you have a, a, a rape case on campus, it is extremely awkward and uncomfortable uh, to have somebody questioning uh, the person that they are accused of victimizing and vice versa. Uh, so that was discouraged. Unfortunately, uh, what ended up happening is the opportunity for anybody to cross-examine them or for you to ask uh, questions that got to uh, credibility uh, was also being curtailed. Um, so this became a, a pretty big issue um, and, and it sort of got swept up in the, in the fervor for uh, you know, regulatory reform as well because it was such a, a, such a step past what the traditional uh, roles of regulation were. Uh, FIRE actually sponsored a lawsuit uh, by a John Doe plaintiff and also uh, Oklahoma Wesleyan University challenging the preponderance mandate. Um, and uh, that, that lawsuit was um, in the pipeline um, and is, is still actually in court right now, uh, but a, it was just last week that Secretary DeVos uh, and the Department of Education officially announced that they would be rescinding the 2011 Dear Colleague letter and this uh, uh, even longer, I think 39 page long 2014 guidance that was trying to clear up a bunch of the confusion that had happened from the letter. Um, and so that's where we are now. Um, we are going to be, uh, you know, looking forward to, um, this seems weird to say, particularly in a libertarian venue like this, but we're looking forward to the regulatory process where, uh, believe it or not, people will have more of a say than they did last time. So sorry, I think I've gone over time, but hopefully that gives you an idea of where we are now. Really useful, kind of just to set out the development of that. And Ella, your thoughts, please. Thank you, Tom. Um, I just want to start off by stating the really the obvious in that this is kind of a really crazy situation that we find ourselves on. It's a really crazy situation that women find themselves on on campus, and I think it's a really grave situation. The problem with um, Title IX, and especially the reaction to DeVos's statement, has kind of took me aback um, about how sort of divisive and strong this issue is. Because uh, to me, it's really very obvious that the, the way that Title IX uh, was being used before DeVos's statement and change it really undermines women's freedom. It creates a situation in which women are not free on campus, that their sexual freedom is undermined, that their every move between the opposite sex is uh, subject to scrutiny, could possibly be involved in investigation and been taken out of their hands in certain um, circumstances. The idea that your personal private matters, your encounters, your relationships, your 
view of yourself as an autonomous individual could be subject to an investigation by some Title IX officer really kind of shakes me. And I think it does, for a lot of women, it's quite a terrifying idea. And of course, this um, piece of law has ended up in, you know, damaging quite a few men's lives. And that's something that we can perhaps talk about. But the thing that I really want to focus on in my opening comments is how this is really detrimental to women, how this really puts women's freedom at an all-time low on campus and completely undermines any notion of uh, the fight for women's liberation. And just to kind of break down why I think and why I feel so strongly about this and why I think it is such a threat, uh, there's certain ways that many of you will be familiar of uh, with cases of Title IX of how it really undermines women's freedom. And the first is obviously the obvious, the way it polices sex. So the way that any kind of interaction that isn't going along these very restricted lines, we could talk about affirmative consent, the kind of policing of whether or not that was consensual at different points in the encounter is something really worrying. The idea that a, a woman's sexual life can be subject to scrutiny can in some cases be taken out of her own hands. There have been cases in which a woman has said, no, this was consensual, please leave me alone. And the Title IX officer continues to pursue the case. The second one is the policing of privacy, which uh, may seem similar, but is slightly different because it's the idea that an external body could have the say over what you view your personal relations to be. And again, another case was of two a uh, couple, a long-standing couple who were roughhousing, I think was the word, play fighting. And a neighbor reported them um, to a Title IX officer and a Title IX investigation went underway even though both parties said we're a couple and this is completely crazy. Actually in that case the woman was told that she was suffering from battered woman syndrome which t to me is absolutely appalling for the idea that that's kind of completely overriding her idea of what's her private relationship. And also the, most the kind of most obvious point is that it completely infantilizes women. One of the really sharp ways that you see this is in the involvement of the discussion about drunk sex. There's this idea that once a woman has a drink, really like has one drink, that she then becomes completely incapacitated, that therefore it's a kind of, any kind of sexual interaction she has, whether that be from you know, kissing right up to sex, is, is you know, non-consensual because obviously she's had a drink and she's been turned into a child. She can't make her own decisions. It really is that extreme in some cases. And then obviously probably the most worrying for us who are concerned with free speech is how any discussion about Title IX now is being completely uh, overridden, completely quashed what happened with us in some ways um, at American University and also uh, Laura Kipnis who's just been mentioned. And I'll just read this. I've read a quote from an LA, LA lawyer who described Kipnis's um, experience as her being investigated for writing about, being investigated for writing about, <laughs> being investigated. So <laughs> wrap your head around that. But I mean, that's how kind of, that's the threat it poses to free speech. And now, Having said all of that, and having given Title IX quite a bad ribbing, um, I think it's quite obvious that this isn't down to just a law, that this isn't, as Robert says, down to the very few words that Title IX um, is. I think it's actually something that's been, Title IX is something that's been weaponized. It's a law that's been used to pursue a kind of much deeper um, political idea and a deeper cultural trend, especially on campus. There is a deep set view on campus today that women are under threat, that women need to be protected, they need to be cosseted, they need to be treated like children and protected from the opposite sex. And uh, you know, for many of us in the room who think that you know, feminists of the past made great gains in terms of the fight for women's freedom, the fight for free speech, the fight for the sexual liberation movement, um, even just the idea that women should be allowed to have drunk sex and, you know, uh, be a bit reckless sometimes is being completely undermined by this trend. And you really can't put that down to a law that, uh, you know, as Rob said, really isn't actually even very old. And sadly, I think that the main culprits of this weaponization are feminists on campus. I think that there's a real uncomfortable uh, feeling about letting uh, women have the freedom to be autonomous individuals to make decisions for themselves, when things get out of their hands and unfortunately when you know, serious cases of rape and sexual assault do happen, the idea that that would be solved by a, some kind of crazy bureaucratic kangaroo court on campus with people who really aren't trained to deal with that is also undermining women's freedom. It's doing a disservice to those women who do need intervention in those serious cases. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, 
women have gained so much, um, and, and feminists in the past and women's liberatory movements in the past have gained so much for women to a situation which I really think it's not an understatement to say that women have it pretty good today. I think, and that's down to the fact that um, great political arguments were waged and won. And I think that the love affair with Title IX that so many campus feminists seem to have now, I mean, after the boss's comments, there was a hashtag going around saying, I need Title IX. It's a, it's a need. It's kind of turned into almost this therapeutic system. Um, really shows that we've, that we've kind of lost sight of what it is to, to be free. And we've lost sight of what it is a women's liberation movement needs. And I think that while we can review Title IX, while we can discuss it and criticise it, we need to look a bit deeper. Thank you very much, Ella. And Elizabeth. Hi. Um, I have been writing, I'm, I'm excited to be here tonight with all of you guys talking about this. I've been writing about Title IX and issues um, sort of surrounding it for a long time. First, um, sort of as, as a women's blogger or a feminist blogger, and now here at Reason for the past about three and a half years. Um, so over the past three and a half years, uh, both my colleague Robbie Suave and I have written a lot about this at Reason. and. Um, gotten to see sort of how some of this has, has evolved over the time um, and, and, and even before that when I was writing about it. So I think one of the important things to remember is that like this didn't spring out of nowhere. This sort of uh, impulse to, to do something about the way colleges handled campus rape and campus sexual assault and harassment was, was because they were very bad at it. Um, you know, like, like police departments were historically very bad at it. I mean, there was a time when they were very much like 100% blaming women for it. There was also just, you know, colleges are, are businesses, so colleges wanted to protect their reputations, so they would rather just sort of sweep these investigations under the rug. And so it makes sense that there was sort of, you know, an effort to sort of reform how colleges were dealing with sexual assault on campus. But one of the things that sort of got in the way and made everything much more complicated is this impulse to have the federal government solve it. And I think when we, when we hear about this problem now, when we hear about Title IX, which does have you know, many, many overreaches, uh, you know, campus feminists back in the day weren't saying, we need Title IX to solve this. Like, now that they are saying that, that is more a creation of activists and politicians. And I'll get back to that in a second. But like, they were just like, we need to do something about this. And then groups who sort of make their living off of, out of uh, you know, getting grants for the stuff and advocating for it, and politicians who want to make for the names for themselves were like, what available tools do we have? And we have Title IX. So they did that. And they, they you know, were like, hey, you can solve this with Title IX. So when you hear people talking about how you know, it's like campus leftists or campus feminists that are pushing that, I agree that you know, you, especially in a lot of the high profile examples from certain campuses, you do see these you know, campus feminist groups or certain, certain campus leftists who are, like, we wanna, you know, who, are, who are pushing this extreme you know, example of Title IX, or approach to Title IX. But the people who are really causing the most damage with it are the college administrators. And the reason that they are college causing this damage with it is because of the government. It's not because, you know, in the media here in the United States, um, a lot of, you know, so much of this gets blamed on the students themselves. And I think that the students, you know, most of them who are, who are not even, you know, in school back in 2011, or, or maybe even still in, like, grade school back in 2011 when this Dear Colleague letter came out, they get to campus and they think, like, how do we deal with things? Well, they've been given this, like, Title IX and this thing, and they think, okay, that's what we do, and that's what we, that's what we do with it. So they don't really know any other way, and they go to their administrators about that. But the real problem is that, you know, the federal government, with, with these policies that Robert described here, they sort of set in motion, like, or, or as again, Ella said, they weaponized it. The federal government weaponized it. They, they said, if you do not do all of these very specific things that have nothing to do with the very specifics of like sex discrimination in education, then we will, we will fine you, we will sue you, you could be liable for so much stuff. And so, and they, they did sue a lot of schools. So when they did, Campus, you know, administrators and leadership reacted by going way over the top. And suddenly they're like, we're going to be just, you know, an abundance of caution is the word that both police and like bureaucrats love to lose, use. And so, you know, they say out of an abundance of caution, 
we are going to make sure that anything that could be slightly offensive from a sexual harassment, anything that really even mentions sex at all, if, if, if someone complains about it or whatever, we are going to investigate that. Any uh, campus sexual assault cases, or camp we're just going to like way go on the side of anyone who makes the accusation without, you know, without concern for these due process things, because it's just better safe than sorry, because they, their reputation and a lot of money too is on the line. And so I think a lot of what we sort of tend to attribute to, uh, you know, college students and stuff is, is sort of, you know, maybe egged on by them, but it, it, it is because they have been put in this situation where these are the tools they have been given and these tools have been used by a lot of people including you know politicians and bureaucrats and campus administrators to further all of their own individual ends which are mostly towards you know like saving their own reputations or furthering their reputations and things and that that has really been a shame both because um, you know, of the of the reasons that we we hate Title IX because we think it is bet or not hate Title, but of the reasons that we have, you guys have been talking about about why Title IX has been bad for um, for people who are accused of these things or accused of sexual assault or accused of rape falsely, for people who are uh, professors and who are feel like their speech is chilled or that they are been investigated for this, but also for students who are victims. Or and who want to report these things because we, you know, seven, ten years ago, like a mass movement to have feminists and progressives on campus do things within their individual campuses and states to reform the way that colleges dealt with stuff, maybe would have actually led to some really good results and some localized results because all these colleges are different, you know? Like, I mean, they're not all bad at this in the same way. So people addressing these specific ways, they were bad. But instead, we had this, you know, federal response handed down to say, you need to do this. And then the college's response has been, to, you know, way over that. And that's just, it's just created all of these bad incentives. So. Thank you very much. Um, so at this point, I'm going to chuck it out straight to you, see if anyone's got any questions, comments. What I'm going to do is see how many people want to say anything. Grab a couple and then bring them back to the panel, so the panel don't jump in straight away. We're going to take a few okay. and, and see what you want to respond to. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a student at American University. And Thank you for views, coming. Thank you, of course. Uh, my views tend to line up a lot more with yours, but I would love to ask you a few questions from what I know as my friend's perspective. I have a pretty good idea of what they would say in response to a lot of what you this said. This is your friend who has this question. <laughs> <laughs> asking for a friend. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so the first thing is that Title IX is not perfect. I don't think anyone is arguing that. What everyone that I know seems to believe is that Title IX is better than what we had before. Okay, uh, but basically that it boils down to that Title IX is better than what we had before. Uh, and there are problems with it, there are due process problems, but these are all civil violations if you look at it from a legal perspective. You're at the 50.1%, there's no right to cross-examine, there's no right to counsel. And when you drop that uh, standard of review, you end up with the problems that you talked about a great deal, innocent people being accused of things. But there's more relief for victims of crime. There's more relief in terms of restraining orders. There's more relief in terms of being able to get people who have been victimized away from their rapists, frankly. And isn't that better than letting rapes go unpunished at all if we're just going to end up punishing a few innocent people rather than letting several victims just have to deal with this? Thank you very much. Um, and anyone else who's just be two rows behind you there, just pass the mic back. <laughs> oh, just there, sorry. <laughs> just there. Thank you. Hi, I'm also an American University student, and um, yeah, kind of unfortunate that it didn't take place on campus. So I was talking to a friend of mine, she's also an undergraduate student at, at the AU today uh, about this event. And anyway, she just started telling me all her, her own personal experience with dealing with people from Title IX. But my point being is that I just keep realizing, as the more I talk about it, that there's so much emotion when it comes to the issue, especially with people that have been affected, have been affected in some ways. But even with, with people who have never had such an encounter, I mean, there is all this idea of uh, of how they felt, how their experience was was for them, how they were um, uh, questioned about what happened, and it's just that people. Ca it's obvious to me that many people can't see be beyond their their emotions and the emotional aspect of the issue. So how can you deal with that? Like, where does reason? And and where does emotion start? Like it's 
it's complete. Some 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 arguments are complete like nonsense and like clear violations of, like ideas of free speech and everything that has to do with it. But it's so overtaken by emotion. I'm just like having no idea how you can deal with people like this. Thank you very much. And Paul, it's like a bleak question, but yes, uh, just over here. Mine's kind of jumping off uh, your comment. Um, preponderance of evidence on college campuses with sexual assault. Um, how important is preponderance of evidence if it's not a like, uh, criminal trial, if it's just the private universities, right? Kind of talking about that a little bit. Thank you. Brilliant. I'm going to squeeze in one more so we can take from here. Yeah, actually, for those of us who aren't totally familiar with this subject, you kept referring to the letter. Can you tell us a little bit about what that letter says, since it sounds like it's great that it's being rescinded? And then also, in terms of, since she brought up the preponderance of the evidence, um, if you could talk a little bit about the interplay between when the campus administration handles a case, is it instead of a criminal trial, or do they get the first bite of the apple, or you know, what's that relationship? Thank you very much. So I'll bring that to the panel now. Robert, do you want to respond to that first? Oh, questions. sure. Yeah. I say so. The dear colleague letter. There, there are several different ways that the uh, the government can regulate, and um, obviously the most obvious is they could pass a law. Title Nine is a, is a statute it was signed by the president and, and put in place by Congress. Um, and then there are, we have regulations that. Um, that different departments will uh, promulgate through this process called notice and comment. So if, the, if a department, let's say the EPA wants to say we're going to regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act, um, they send it, you know, in the, in the ideal process, they say, okay, here's the regulation that's gonna do that. Um, they send it out and the public and industry and, and basically anybody with a stake in it has a chance to say, okay, I like this, I don't like this. Um, here's the problems, and the agency has to respond to those questions. Uh, they don't have to. They don't have to change their mind, but they do have to respond to them, and they do have to sort of give their reasoning for it. Um, and and there's sort of rules about how much reason and how much arbitrariness they can they can use there. Um, then we have this dear colleague letter uh, thing, and what that is is that that is those letters purport to be, and I don't think every department does this, but, ed, but the Department of Education really got into doing this. They purport to be just a helpful, that's why they start, dear colleague, um, you know, they, a helpful uh, explanation of what the law and regulations uh, require. Um, so if you wanna, you know, not get in trouble under Title IX, which by the way, if you are judged to have violated Title IX as a uh, college, there's only one remedy, and that's you lose all of your federal funding. That's a death sentence for most universities. So it's well, a... Right, like that's why I was saying the colleges have such incentives to do whatever they can to avoid it. This remedy is so bad, it has that. never happened. Nobody has yeah. ever done it. But it could happen, and it would destroy any college except maybe Harvard. No, uh, who issued the Dear Colleague? Who issued the Dear Colleague letter? Uh, it was issued by... Uh, the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights of the Department of Education. Um, and so that's a, a the sub... Yeah, the Office for Civil Rights is, is within the, the yeah. Department of Education. And There's about I'm, glad, I'm glad we clarified that, but rather than get caught in the particulars, you should buy Robert's book, which you get all yeah. the information. Uh, very <laughs> exactly. So anyway, that's but, um, a dear colleague letter, and it's not supposed to come up with new regulations, but this one did. Exactly. Um, that's, that's, that's where we think they violated the law um, and just general propriety. Um, I was just. Well, I think at this point, I just want to bring Ella in particularly yeah. on this point that the gentleman made at the front. But I'd like to hear your thoughts on it as well. But particularly this um, point about what do you do effectively? Mm. Because I think many of us would sort of bulk at, for instance, this sort of parallel system that you see on campus. But given the fact that oh, historically many people felt that they were um, mm. not treated very well, not just by the campus authorities, but actually by the police. How do you deal with a, with a mm. problem like that? No, I'm really glad you brought it up. I actually think the two of your points um, go well together because. Um, it's very true, and one thing that Betsy DeVos said that no matter whether you, people absolutely hate her or completely love her, one thing that everybody agrees with that she said is one rape is one rape too many. And I think in tandem with that, while we really believe in that one innocent person being accused is one innocent person too many, that is a very strong belief of ours as well. So I really think that you get into such dangerous territory when you start weighing up the idea that, um, oh, if a couple of innocent people go by the way, said, hey, that's, you know, that's a good thing for justice, that's a terrible thing for justice. Um, that's a te does, as I said, a terrible disservice to women who you know, believe in due process and freedom and all that kind of thing. And I think that we need to sort of 
dare I say it, dial down the emotionalism on campus. And with the understanding that when things like this happen, of course it is terrible and emotional and, you know, non-reasonable because your emotions aren't always reasoned and that's absolutely an understanding. But the idea that then you would build a system around that idea, you would build a system around something that is often deeply subjective, often deeply, you know, subject to abuse and with the preponderance of reverence and the 50% in a feather, that is an abuse of um, due process in my view. Then you get into a very dangerous territory where if we have a problem with um, rape and sexual assault on campus, which I think is not as big as a problem as it's made out to be, then doing this kind of system, which really heavily weighs justice in a very bad way, I think is a really wrong, wrong road to go down. And Elizabeth, obviously feel free to respond to anything you've heard, but particularly on Ella's point there, because this is an argument that we at Spike to make, many other people have made, which is that you're not necessarily just dealing with a particular problem and there's good or bad solutions to that. You're, there's also a slight degree of which the potential problem of sexual assault has been kind of exaggerated, it's been referred to as hysteria in some respects. Um, what do you think of, of that charge and how does that change your perspective on this in terms of it's all just about how the federal government have responded to these things? Well, I mean, I think to, to his point about Title IX, no one is, you know, Title IX is not going to be repealed and, and the way that Title IX is, has been enforced, with, as he said, right, as Robert was saying, you know, if we roll back some of the ways that colleges are being punished for Title IX violations, it would not stop, obviously, Title IX from existing and these protections from existing. It would also not stop the, the momentum on campus. For good or bad, it would not stop the momentum on campus that has developed around these issues. So I don't think it would roll back like a lot of campus protections that have been sort of fought over over the past 10 years and things. It would just roll back colleges responded to them in these these super extreme ways. Um, but I mean, I think when, when Ella's talking here, I think she, she does a good example of doing one of the things that goes to your point about how you deal with emotional issues. And, you know, it's good to be coming from a point of empathy, which a lot of times libertarians are very bad at doing. Um, people in general in, you know, the public policy sphere can be bad at doing. Um, and I write, I write about, uh, another thing I write about a lot is like um, sex work and prostitution, which also dovetails with sex trafficking laws. And I think a lot of the ways that we, we handle that are very bad with the, the way we like craft criminal justice solutions to that. So when I try to argue about that, it's sort of the same thing about when you try to argue about sexual assault on campus. I mean, people just want to be like, oh my God, I hate you because you're disagreeing with my solution to this. Mm -hmm. And it's always very important to stress that you are coming, you know, you want the same things that they do. Your same end goals are the same. You just have different ways that you think it is good to approach it. Um, I mean, I think that that's a small thing, but it's something we don't do enough to say like, yes, like this is a problem, but like maybe we are not, you know, we're not addressing it in the right way. Definitely. And Robert, I'll cut you off, so yeah. No, that's fine. A, a couple points just because those are very typical um, sorts of questions. Uh, is Title IX going away? It's being rolled back to the status of April 3rd, 2011. So if you remember those dark days of the first uh, Obama administration, that, that's literally all that happened um, with, you know, a couple weeks ago. So I, I, and I, this is not the first time I've heard like, oh, Title IX is gone or Title IX is being revoked. Like they, they, that power, I mean, that, that would have to be Congress. Um, you would probably hear it. Like there wouldn't be any, uh, you know, uh, lack of clarity over that one. Um, but a couple of things. Um, there's a sense, and somehow this sense has has been um, twisted up there. Huh? Why my book Twisted Title Nine available on Amazon.com? Um, that the uh, that the response the Title Nine requires some sort of finding of guilt for someone to in order to do anything for a person who says they're a victim of sex discrimination. And it doesn't. Um, Title IX, the, the mandate under Title IX is to end the discrimination. Um, it doesn't, the, nowhere in Title IX does it say you actually have to have a faux trial. Um, all it says is you have to end it. So the, I hear a lot like, well, how are women going to get, or, or accusers generally, it can be men too, obviously, and it is sometimes, uh, these protections. And the answer is when they're non-punitive, they, those protections can and should still be extended. So for instance, if you say, oh, this guy in my dorm raped me or whatever, um, they, can, you know, they can move you. 
uh, they, they, you know, if it's, if it's an emergency situation, uh, they can even move him without his consent. Now, eventually you'd want to figure out whether or not there's any merit to the, the thing. But when it comes to people, keeping people apart, when it comes to counseling, when it comes to a lot of things that I really hear people worried about that are not going to happen, that you don't actually have to go through a trial in order to do any of that. And to the extent that colleges aren't providing that for accusers uh, right now, um, you know, without going through all that, I think they're making a mistake. Um, they need to be doing that anyway. As, as long as it's non-punitive measures that keep people feeling safe, there, there isn't a problem with that. The other thing is the, um, and I want to address real quick, uh, the, the statistical argument. Fire has stayed out of that because I am not a statistician and I don't know if, you know, we don't have the expertise to know what the nature of, of crisis is on campus or not. Here's what we do know from learning a thousand years, and I'm not exaggerating, a thousand years of Anglo-American justice has led us to the conclusion um, that you cannot use generalizations about groups of people in order to make decisions about the person who is sitting in front of you, right? So I, I, we hear a lot like this, uh, only 2% only of accusations are false, or only 8% of or 2 to 8, or you know, whatever it is. Um, you hear that all the time. So we, the, the implication is that, well, then we don't really need due process because like, odds are good we got the right guy. Um, here's the thing, like maybe the odds in the cosmic sense are good that you got the right guy. But the problem is that tells you that, that stereotype, it's a prejudice, it's a stereotype, tells you nothing about the exact person who you are sitting in front of, you're the jury, you're the fact finder, and is doing. Um, it's, it's, there's this, and I am not a mathematician either, but it's the same fallacy uh, that comes up. Let's say you, you flip a coin nine times and it comes up heads every time. A lot. It, it sort of intuitively makes sense that the tenth time is good. That, that it's a really good chance it's going to come up tails. The last time, it's also what keeps casinos in business, right? Except it's still fifty percent. Like it actually doesn't change it. It only those things only make sense in, in the sense of large numbers. So the fact that a bunch of people before were all guilty has nothing to do with the person sitting in front of you. And so, from our perspective, and from a I think from a justice perspective. It wouldn't matter to us if 99% of them are true or 99% of accusations are false. It makes no difference because you've got to evaluate the case that's in front of you. And if you're not doing that, you are begging, you are literally asking to enter prejudice into it. And I don't, I don't really think we need to relearn that lesson as a, as a country. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take Elizabeth and Helen. Yeah, I, I, I just want to add to that. I think it's important to remember that one of the big parts of Title IX that doesn't get as much attention as the sort of student on student conduct is the, the academic freedom issue and the fact that so many professors are being called into these crazy Title IX inquiries for things they say in class just because if anyone reports that it made them uncomfortable in any way then they have to be Title IX, have, you know, they, they feel like they have to investigate it, the schools do because of this, you know, super intense punishment imperative. And, um, you know, as, as I said earlier today, I've been writing about this for, for uh, you know, yeah, back before the 2011 Dear Colleague letter, so I've been writing about this for a while now. And I think I had a lot of liberal friends back in the day who were very just like, this is, this is stupid. Like, you know, like, this is just a right-wing talking point. This is just a stupid concern. And I, I even have to say that uh, we've, got, we've got Kathy Young in the audience here, and she's written for a reason about this, like, way back in the day. And I kind of remember being a younger, a younger feminist and libertarian and read her stuff being like why is she harping on like this whole thing for due process like whatever um but the more and more the you know the more and more i've like actually read these cases and the more and more you realize these academic freedom issues that it gets into it the real the more you realize that it, it's not just about this and 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 a lot of the times um you know i've been around i've a lot of academics and a lot of like leftist academics and socialist academics and even them now even they recently have been like I have not wanted to admit, but like, oh my God, yes. Like, people are afraid of their students. People are afraid to talk about any sort of controversial issues because they're students. And like, just been in the baby mess two or so years that I feel like I've heard that from a lot of my more like liberal friends because they've just been like, I don't want to like say it, but it's just like, there's no getting around that. There's no getting around the fact that whether or not it is warranted in every individual circumstance with the students, like professors feel a lot of fear that they are going to get written up for some stupid thing and then you know, go through this crazy yeah, inquiry that Laura Kipnis went through. And so it does chill a lot of what they talk about, and that's, that's a sort of underlooked thing that doesn't have anything to do with like, campus safety, really. Yeah, to be, Laura Kipnis has been investigated twice. She yeah. got investigated for the first thing, and then it was recently revealed 
that she was investigated for writing a book about that investigation. So I think that's, you know, to, so to be clear, they got really embarrassed investigating her the first time and then they went ahead and did it again. Yeah. It's yeah. absolutely insane. And everyone's yeah. just looking to, Ella, obviously, feel free to respond to anything you've heard. But I'd be interested on this point that um, Elizabeth raised and we've heard a little bit about, whereas this response is when you criticize, could be the statistics, could be the policy, where it's kind of idea was like, why are you talking about this? Yeah. <laughs> and even pointing out, say, fear mongering in relation to something like this is yeah. seen as questionable. Do you think that in and of itself it's still a problem, given the fact that there's no one in this room who doesn't want this problem to be tackled, obviously? Yeah. Um, what is the problem then of um, why is it so important, therefore, that we actually challenge some of the overzealous claims or indeed the overzealous solutions to this? So yeah, I think fear mongering is one of the most stifling things in this conversation because there is this idea that, so just to bring it back to my point, that there is this idea that women are under imminent threat when they get to university. It's very similar in the UK similar situation in which women are actually actively encouraged to feel worried about their encounters, to be concerned about when they meet men, to, to kind of be worried about what could happen. It's all about the dangers of sexual encounters rather than the you know, potential enjoyment of them and the excitement of being an adult out in the world. Uh, in Reason's done a lot of great articles sort of um, busting some of these myths. There's the classic one in five one that was much talked about. Um, that one in five women were going to experience sexual harassment on campus in the US and that was you know, proven to be based on only two universities. It was a complete kind of crock of fear mongering and it, and it worked. It did actually freak out a lot of women. I think the, really, the, the battle we have here is that a lot of uh, young women having been told all of this and having kind of not, not being party to discussions about Title IX and its ineffectiveness or any of this are kind of thinking oh, right, so university is going to be this really horrible, scary place for me, and every time I kind of get into a situation where I'm a bit pissed with a guy, then something really bad could happen. Then obviously you've got this stifling environment in which you, it's, you know, this crazy thing in which you, people are calling Betsy DeVos a rape apologist. You know, and, and I get called a rape apologist for criticising this, which is not only just, you know, hugely insulting, but completely farcical, because it's not what we're talking about. The one really key thing to state is that... Um, Lots of these cases of sexual harassment, um, not, so, not rape, but sexual harassment, the, the, what you know, constitutes sexual harassment today is huge. It can be an unfortunate joke, because one Title IX investigation did actually involve a, a guy. A Beach Boys song. I was looking yeah. at good ones that I've written about, and a Beach Boys song exactly. is, I think, the best one. Reason's but, um, got some great lists of ones of a guy who wrote his teacher's name wrong on a... Um, on a quiz of somebody who yeah, made a joke and, or somebody who kind of makes the leap and decides that after a date they're going to kiss someone. There was actually one, just one case, um, I think it was in the University of Massachusetts, where um, a woman and a man who had a sexual experience, she actually stated at the time, it's completely consensual, I enjoyed it, that was fine. I then went home and about an hour or so later, my resident advisor's training, my bureaucratic training, kicked in. And I realized that I'd actually been assaulted. And so then the Title IX case rolled on from there. So you're encouraging women to completely reconsider their gut instincts, yeah. their own intelligence, their own you know, experience of what happened, because, campus, because sexual harassment has been widened out and actually really sort of in the process made it much less of a serious thing. Well, the new thing to maybe... At this point, I just want to bring it just to bring We've been wittering on. Let's go now. Some questions from the audience. So who's got a question, a point? Yeah, Kat. I think there's, a mic. there's a mic there. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, I'm Kathy Young and I have been <laughs> writing for a reason for a long time about these issues. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points. First of all, um, Elizabeth mentioned that you know prior to the Dear Colleague letter, colleges were really terrible at handling this. I think that there was probably a great deal of sort of variety and diver well diversity, you know, not in the sense of how different campuses were handling this. Because actually this is not entirely a new issue. I mean, this was there was another huge kind of wave of concern about this in the early 1990s when, you know, I mean, I look at some of the stuff I wrote like in 1994 and it's like, oh, well, you know, apparently we're going through a lot of the same debates. And I think a lot of colleges uh, back then kind of passed their own policies that were pretty sort of intrusive, actually, in dictating how people should go about, you know, approaching mm -hmm. someone sexually, like, you know, asking for explicit consent at every step, which, you know, now pretty is actually sort of the law in, in California and several other states. Mm -hmm. 
for college campuses only. But you know, one thing that I also wanted to say, and I think Alyssa, I think Ella sort of touched on this. I think the the elephant in the room here really is how young people are being taught to perceive and define rape and sexual assault. Because when we're talking about you know the, how much of a problem this really is, I think the real question is you know what exactly is this you know like what are we talking about? Are we talking about you know behavior or experiences that may be very hurtful personally that may feel very traumatic, but you know are not necessarily non-consensual? Are we talking about because uh, right now? Uh, and by the way, that's the, that one in five study. One of the definitions, one of the measurements, was that they basically asked women whether they had ever had, you know, what they eventually concluded was unwanted sex due to being under the influence of alcohol and drugs. Now, obviously, you know, if you're passed out and you're, you know, sexually assaulted or you're nearly unconscious and you really have no idea what's going on. I don't think any civilized person, you know, at this point in time would argue that that should not be considered rape or sexual assault. However, you know, we're seeing situations in which someone who is intoxicated, but, you know, someone who is in sufficient possession of their faculties to, you know, send text messages. There was a case at Occidental, which Robbie Suave wrote about, in which, uh, you know, these two young people well, who had been... Too much into oh, right, okay. Right, okay, yeah. Again. Okay, so yeah, and, and I just want to say, you know, in many of these cases, the young women are actually encouraged by, you know, university officials or, you know, uh, professors to reassess this experience as rape. And I, I just want to wrap up real quick by saying that I think in many of these cases, there could be a more effective intervention if it wasn't treated as sexual assault. You know, if it was treated as a personal situation that is traumatic that, uh, that you know may require some sort of counseling but shouldn't necessarily be considered as the sort of black and white situation with a perpetrator and a victim so you know that's, that's really interesting yeah. yes. uh, um, microphone two uh, right next to you then I'm going to uh, should I pass right. it on to just right on your left um, so now that the legal machinery behind uh, Title IX investigations is in place even if Betsy DeVos's you know reinterpretation of the agency reg of the regulation and the, and the law, even if that changed, how much change will we actually see given the historic, like, you know, reluctance of colleges to actually roll back these kind of things? Um, I was very interested in the um, point that Ella made in her opening comments, and I'd like her to just explain it a little bit more, that the real um, impact of the climate in uh, colleges at the moment is that it infantilizes women. Because I think that the, um, you know, I know that when I was, uh, you know, when, when I think about these issues, I think there is a tendency, as, as someone at the front said, to, to say, well, yeah, maybe a couple of people get wrongly accused, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, that's a shame, but so what? But when you start saying that it actually infantilizes all women, all women students, and treats uh, women as just victims and treats women in, in, in a, as though they are in need of protection, then I think it's a much more um, powerful uh, uh, sort of um, uh, problem. In, and, and, and I think that in looking at that, that how women have become infantilized by these regulations, I think is quite an interesting thing to explore. And I'm kind of interested, because I can remember when I went to college many moons ago, um, that the last thing I wanted anybody to do was to, you know, restrict my uh, adulthood. It was like, this was my big step into the world, that's what I wanted to do, it's all about being grown up and f free. And I would just wonder how we've got to this point that women are, uh, on campus, stu female students, or not all of them, obviously, but many women have um, allowed themselves to become um, kind of in need of protection and that they want protection. And what would Ella say to why that's happened? And, you know, in the papers, we always read about the notion of snowflakes. You know, this whole generation is snowflakes. Is it just that they're snowflakes or is there something else going on? Okay, there's 
Hi, uh, I go to George Washington University and Betsy DeVos actually spoke at our school this morning. So it's really a uh, good time to talk about this. Um, I was curious if you could expand on, I know each of you touched on um, what happens to the men in these cases. Um, and a lot of cases go through where they do have the tribunal and there is not enough evidence and the men live with it for the rest of their lives. Um, if you could just talk about what happens even after due process, what happens after the tribunal when the culture won't let them go. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to come up one more time before we close. So um, I'll make sure we get the last couple of people I do see. Um, first off, Ella, I just wonder if you could address that, that question about, about what do you say to someone who um, has taken on board this idea that women are somewhat peril and needs support? Yeah, the infantilization question is fascinating because it really goes against the idea that this is a snowflake phenomenon, that this is just kind of like a snowflake dropped out of the sky, that suddenly, as Elizabeth said, that suddenly students are demanding this. It's actually very interesting to note that students aren't demanding these um, measures, that there isn't a mass movement on campus, no matter, kind of, it's sort of a bit um, deceiving going on Twitter these days, but um, there isn't a mass movement on US campuses from women to enact these kind of measures. There isn't a desire to be um, protected in things very much in many ways a top-down thing. But I think the, what really speaks to the infantilization idea is that you have a kind of uh, culture, not just with feminists, but also a broader culture that says that young people need to be protected, that university is not just to teach you whatever subject you've gone there to learn, but also to nurture you, to protect you, to enhance your well-being, to um, make you feel safe, in real the unsafe space, to, and that kind of notion really makes students think, okay, this isn't just about academic rigor, what you know, I understand university should be. It's about feeling safe, and so for women, that feeling safe obviously encompasses you know, your interactions with men, uh, because that can be an unsafe, that can be a risky thing, not in the very serious measure, but just in the, the you know, throes of relationships. So what this really does and what the kind of Title IX um, investigations and scrutiny of sexual uh, relations does is it tells women that they aren't adults, that they aren't, especially with the drunk sex thing, that they aren't as equal to men. That's the most shocking thing to me, is that they are different to men, they, you know, they, they experience these relationships and these interactions and sexual freedom differently to men. And that difference is that they are not adults because they have to have these, these measures in place. So it, it's, that's very much about what the point I think lots of us are trying to make in that Title IX is not really the problem here. The problem is how we got to a situation in which women are being told to think of themselves as children and not as adults who are free to deal with these things uh, themselves. And Robert, is there anything you want to pick up from what we've heard from the floor? Oh, um, you know, with uh, with regard, you know, just to the the uh, to clarify on some of the that we've been talking about the drunk sex problem and and obviously alcohol is a huge factor on college campuses. Um, what what we were what we had been seeing, and this is one of the ways in which uh, universities went further than I think even the, the the federal government was requiring. Although it's sort of a better safe than sorry thing is, uh, just to be clear, this is not an exaggeration. Um, universities would start to say that you couldn't consent while intoxicated. Yeah. So usually that's what they would say. Um, the thing is, the, the definition of intoxication is not the same as incapacitation, um, and it's not limited to being so drunk, for instance, you can't drive, um, or you can't consent, etc. Any level of intoxication, so, you know, imagine, I guess not one single drop of alcohol, but the second you start feeling an effect of alcohol, you are intoxicated. And what they were saying is any sexual activity that takes place after that point um, is not consensual, and that even if you did consent, you still did it. Um, and so the, the case at Occidental was like that. Um, and one of the other, this is sort of a race to the courthouse problem that's also happened, is generally speaking, um, both parties are at least intoxicated to that degree uh, when, when that's involved. And so whoever complained first would be considered the injured party. So we would see people say, well, I was actually also drunk and have no idea what was going on. And the answer would be, too bad, you can bring your own thing later. But th by that point, you know, they may have already been expelled. Um, so, you know, most schools have started to uh, some, to some extent from hectoring from fire, like back off of that and then say, okay, it's incapacitation, uh, which is where it should be. Um, 
uh, it certainly shouldn't be at the intoxication level, but just, just to be clear, I'm not exaggerating this, and, and you may want to look in, I mean, it may still be around in your policies, so that's something that you might want to look into if you are a student now. It may still be hiding in there. But just Joe Biden's famously said, drunk sex is rape, is right. rape, is rape, and that's exactly what he says. I'm quoting directly right. there, so it, yeah, it really is that crazy. Watch yourselves, young people. Um, Elizabeth, is there anything you want to? Uh, yeah, well, just one of the other weird things that, that along these lines is like this new thing is the neurobiology of trauma, which is this thing that they're informing all the Title X coordinate, Title IX coordinators on, and uh, all the politicians on. It's even been written to a lot of legislation. It's this idea that women, that people who are having unwanted sexual advances might freeze and go into like a coma-like mode and not be able to respond and also not remember anything but then be able to piece it back together perfectly later. And this does not correspond with like anything that is in actual like neuroscience or, or psychology at all but they're now like teaching this on college campuses and you know um, Emily Afiat uh, at Atlantic wrote a piece about this recently and it was like Proof that someone or someone not remembering the details right at first, but then later having details that say they were assaulted, is seen as evidence that that was really an assault because of this neurobiology of trauma that they're pushing, and so it's just this sort of ridiculous, this ridiculous sort of thing that is based on no sort of scientific evidence at all, and it goes against like most of our scientific evidence we have about memory and how it forms and these sorts of things, um, but also. Yes, it, 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 tells, it tells people, and mostly women, that it is 100% normal if, not in the face of fear, not in the face of force or coercion or threats or violence or anything, but just in the face of an unwanted sexual advance, just 100% freezing up for not just a few seconds, not just a minute or two, but for you know like an extended period of time and not being able to say or do anything, that that is normal. And that is not actually, like that is, there's nothing that says this is a normal biological response. Now, I'm not saying that like we should blame someone if that is what happens to them, right? But that is not a normal response. And you have people teaching people that this happens in up to 50% of cases, which is just, you know, so now you have people who are new to sex, who are, you know, 18 and 19 years old, they're new to sex, they don't know exactly how to handle unwanted sexual advances, or if they're the one making the advances, to how to read their partner's consent, right? Because they're new to this. And now you have them hearing, yeah, that like, oh, well, like, if you don't want something and you don't want to say no, don't say no because it's totally normal not to. And so we're, we're not just like infantilizing them, but we're actually giving them the wrong, the, or the exact opposite tools they need to be able to assert themselves in situations. And I think, yeah, that's like one of the real tragedies. Yeah, I want to address your question, but uh, one other way in my book, Twisting Title IX, uh, you can read it, uh, one of the stories I talk about there is a Stanford student, and there they were training the jurors, the, the, the fact finders in the case, that acting persuasive and logical was a sign of guilt. Um, and because they're basically, the idea was, well, if you're scattered, you know, we would expect yeah. a real victim to be scatterbrained, um, uh, but if, they, if it's not, um, you know, then you should have more credibility and, and vice versa, that predators, they've got their story all figured out. So the more sense their story makes, the more suspicious you should be. That may be true. It may also be that they remember what happened and are telling a story that holds together because this will happen. Um, but that was, that was one of the things that the figure in Stanford. You asked what happened to the students. Um, you know, I, I've had the, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it a privilege, but the opportunity to, to speak with a lot of folks who've been in that situation, and uh, generally they don't go back to college. Um, you know, I've heard stories about suicide attempts. I haven't heard of a successful one, thankfully. Um, you know, many times I've, I've been glad to see families rally around the people who, you know, either are falsely accused or believe they're falsely accused. Look, I mean, I don't profess to know whether or not something happened or not, but I can tell you how they feel. Um, the, uh, the thing to remember, and, and this is sort of a, a weird character of justice, and, and you know, sorry to like sound like lawyer guy again here, but for whatever reason, it, it's a principle of justice that if people, that it is worse to, it, it's worse for confidence in a justice system when you are convicting people who are innocent mm -hmm. than letting the guilty go. I, don't, I think maybe it's a human nature thing, but for whatever reason, I mean, that's why, you know, the famous British jurists say, like, it's better to let 10 guilty men go than uh, put one innocent man in jail. as Blackstone who said that. Um, but the, re the reason there's a feeling about that is you cannot undermine anything faster than by putting somebody innocent, um, you know, or punishing them for the wrong crime. I don't know why that is, but if we don't have a system we can trust, all of the, the supposed benefits that we're supposed to see for making it easier to come forward, they are not going to materialize. 
And Helen, is there anything you want to No, I wait for the last. I'll wait for the next one. Yeah. I was just wondering, just before I'm going to come back out and grab some more before we sum up, but particularly the point that Elizabeth was making about are we kind of engendering a generation with just straightforwardly a fear of sex? Is that something which is going to be yeah. a consequence of all this? Yeah, stuff? definitely. I mean, certainly. If, I'm glad you brought up the question of boys. I've spoken to a lot of people who have young sons going to university who are genuinely worried about what happens when you, you know, when the kind of, everyone can imagine a, a romantic situation or your first kiss in which you, I certainly didn't kind of speak into an app or sign a piece of paper that said, yes, you can kiss me. Um, it, it, you know, things happen, the kind of part of the risk of a relationship, of new relationships can be bad. It can also be the start of something wonderful. And I think, uh, you know, I'm a romantic, but I think that's what's really worryingly at stake here is the idea that human interaction should be seen as something that's a negative rather than a positive, that you should always be worried about your first interaction with someone new, that you should always be concerned with your first sexual encounter because it might turn out bad. When you know What we should be saying to young people is the majority of times it will turn out good. And even if it does turn out not to be the exact kind of movie moment, you're strong enough to handle that, you're strong enough to make your own decisions about that, and you don't need a campus authority coming in and telling you what to think about it. And on that contentious point, we're going to um, bring it back out to the floor. So there's any more points, questions? Nico. Yeah. Person in the back. There's one at the back. There. Hey, so I think uh, Kathy alluded to the some, uh, uh, some of the solution here, and I think based on a, a comment that Elizabeth made at the beginning, law enforcement is also not great at dealing with sexual assault cases. So what does a, so if it's, if the university's uh, 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 tribunals with lax, lack of due process and take all for a given that that's awful and not working, but going to law enforcement isn't a great answer at this point either, what does a, a good system or solution look like? I think there's a few more around here. Is there someone that has up right behind me? There. Yeah, it's a similar question because um, I was reassured, Ella, by your point that the women, women on campus are not searching out for these infantilizing measures. Um, and I'm also very reassured, though horrified in the same, same breath, by the exposés that have been done um, around the one in five and the massive increase in assaults on Super Bowl Sunday and the Jackie case in Virg University of Virginia and the exposés around those which have shown them to be tissues of lies. Um, but I, I am very concerned and this might be me living in the DC bubble where everyone seems to be liberal or very close to them. And I look at my Facebook and Twitter feeds after DeVos sent out that letter and it was, there was a lot of vilification of what she was doing. And I <clears throat> manfully tried to push back and, well, I, I, I retreated after a while, I've got to admit. <laughs> it was not pleasant, but that's fine, you know. Um, but so, you know, what, what do we do to turn the tide and, you know, how sure can we be that, that the, 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 the consensus is not that we need to protect um, and infantilize people in order for them to 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 grow up to be to be mature adults. There's someone over here. Okay, let's go to this gentleman here in the blue shirt, just a little bit forward, and then I'll come over there. Before we uh, I have questions about uh, the upcoming rulemaking, specifically maybe that's for Robert. Um, uh, do you expect it to result in maybe the same kind of flexibility-oriented approach of the interim guidance? Uh, where colleges have the choice of how they're going to run a proceeding, maybe join a consortium to outsource these proceedings, and uh, also how do you uh, size up the different coalitions, I guess, on each side versus uh, the survivor groups versus the due process groups, uh, who's better organized, uh, who is uh, maybe going to dominate this proceeding? Thank you. And there's some people this side. Yeah. Gentleman there. I, uh, this question is also mostly directed towards Robert. Um, at the start, you mentioned that Title IX has been a great success because in the years following Title IX, uh, participation among women in college sports increased. Well, that dramatic. aspect of it has been, yeah. But is there evidence to show that it was actually a result of Title IX? Because at the same time, women were also joining the workforce at much higher rates. Could it be that women were just joining sports much more? 
Oh, one over here. Um, it's not a very long question, but essentially, all of you have touched upon, um, you know, the view that a lot of students at college campuses might have due process, and it's this negative perspective on it. You know, seeing it as more of a thing for um, perpetrators rather than for victims and things like that. So I just want to was wondering, in, in general, um, do you have any opinion in what the repercussions of having a generation of students growing up? with this negative view of due process and what it could happen in the world, you know, once they start graduating and getting out into the real world and such. Um, any more before we come back? Yeah, I'm going to take you and you very quickly and then we'll come back and close before. This is for Ella. Um, I want to know why schools would want to train college girls to reevaluate their experiences that they thought were consensual because when they say that they're not consensual, doesn't that put the school through more risk, more money, and isn't it good for the school if the student thought she consented and they don't have to deal with it? Thank you, and gentleman at the front row. Is that the same question? Brilliant, well at this point I'm going to bring it back to the panel. So I'm going to ask you each just to take a couple of minutes, or is there anyone I've missed? Yeah, just take, take the mic. Um, so I'm going to ask you each just to take a couple of minutes to either address some of the questions you've heard or just offer a kind of final thought, what next, what can we do about it, what's the thing on the horizon, I'm going to go Elizabeth first and work down the line. Uh, I will speak to the police question because um, that's you know, one of the things I've written about a lot and um, you know, despite the statistics about, about one in four on college campuses, which you know, as Kathy mentioned, are often, or as in, you've mentioned, are often through flawed mythology. Um, a lot of the ones where they try to do follow-ups, like the Washington Post and various things have done studies where follow-ups where the, the, the definitions are even more ridiculous. They'll, they won't actually, they'll say, you know, one in four unwanted sexual conduct and that'll be so much as like a kiss, which is like you said, like someone leans in for a kiss and you don't want it, like maybe just tell them no, don't like report them for a Title IX violation. So, um, but you know, this sort of thing makes it seem like college, that rape is, in, you know, endemic on college campuses. And actually, you know, studies show that it is the same or even much lower on college campuses than it is for same age group outside of college campuses. And also still only something like 30% of Americans get a college degree. And most of them are not even going to like residential four year campuses. So this like subset of people we're talking about I mean, it's so crazy that this has captured the national imagination. Like all of the media, like around like young people and rape, like centers on Title IX, and and I get it because it is such a like crazy thing that like our government is focused on so much. But I mean, that is such a small percentage of things. So I think it's you know instead of focusing on, it's actually a very privileged way to look at it. Instead of focusing on like making things maybe better for this small set of the most like sort of privileged people, like why don't if yes, police can be bad at things. Police have been getting better over the past few decades they are not great but like if we focus so people on college campuses focus on their own you know their own schools people in general focus on like reforming the way that the criminal justice system and police in general deal with sexual assault then that could benefit so many more people than this very narrow focus that we have with title IX and these sorts of things thank you very much Robert yeah well, on the criminal justice thing I mean it's it's, it's worth remembering that uh, like you said, it, it's, it's affecting a small slice of people overall, but the, the best case scenario at a college is the same as the worst case scenario when it goes to law enforcement. The best case scenario at a college is somebody gets expelled and they're walking around on the street the next day. That's literally yeah, that's the worst yeah. case scenario when you report a rape to law enforcement is that they get away with it and they're walking around the next day. So it, it's worth remembering that. Um, the other thing is somebody had asked, you know, how do we get past the emotions or, you know, how do this? I think there is a part of the reason rape is such a serious crime, and it, it's important to remember that it was the last capital crime that wasn't murder, um, and it was only rape was actually a death penalty offense in like Louisiana up until like the 80s. And the reason it's considered so serious, I think one of the reasons there's many different reasons, is that there is no winner in this. Uh, like like there's no way to make it good. Like when a rape happens, it is such a severe trauma that expecting there to be a good outcome uh, from this, I don't, I don't, think, is re I don't think is realistic. Um, we can do the best we can, and I, I don't think police have traditionally done that, or colleges have, but it is, a, it is a hugely damaging crime. 
And there isn't really any way to put those pieces back together. And I think we need to be conscious of that, um, you know, and, and have expectations, um, you know, that are, that are commensurate with that. We need to have compassion for people who are going through this because there's, there's no way to really fix it. Um, and then finally, you know, with what to expect, the regulatory process, um, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, Title IX regulations that are out there now require that uh, tribunals be equitable. Um, and you know, there's a lot of different aspects of equity. Uh, the 2011 letter sort of reduced those to just preponderance of the evidence. Uh, but for instance, FIRE did a survey we released just a couple weeks ago uh, where we talked about due process protections in place. And we found that uh, I think it was 74% of, of the top 53 campuses, according to US News, don't guarantee students who are accused the presumption of innocence. Uh, that's a pretty basic procedural protection and the fact that it's missing three quarters of the time is probably not an accident. Um, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, on campuses and, and what I consider it to be equitable, to be in a justice system that didn't say you're presumed innocent or proven guilty, no, but maybe I'm old fashioned. Thank you very much. And Ella, your final thoughts. Um, we've discussed some crazy cases here tonight and um, some of the things it's hard not to laugh at because it seems so perverse, but I really think that we've We've got a really serious situation on our hands, and I think it's not too strong a way to put it that we're facing a new sexual inquisition on campus, and that women's um, freedom and students' freedom is seriously on the line. And I don't think that there is a quick fix to this, unfortunately. And as we've all said, that uh, how far these reviews to Title IX go isn't going to change the situation that students find themselves on campus. Someone asked how we can turn the tide. Uh, that is sort of a, a, an easier thing. It's to say that really the people who are so virulently pro Title IX, who declare that women need to be cosseted and protected, who have this kind of perverse idea that women should be infantilized, are a minority of people. Certainly on campus, the majority of students do not want a safe space. They do not need to have these measures and they don't uh, actually really engage in any of this process because they get on with their lives as adults at university, they have sex, sometimes it's drunk, and they're fine. I think what the problem is here is that um, certainly government and officials are listening to a minority of people who have really taken this issue too far and who have pushed the idea that women need to be costed on campus. So how to fix it, it's really to argue that students should be free, that university shouldn't be a safe space, that it should be unsafe, that it should be full of potential and risk and excitement and that really we champion the idea that both women and men should be free, autonomous individuals to decide these issues for themselves. Thank you very much. Can you join me in thanking our panel? Thank Thanks so much, everyone. Um, if you're interested, please um, come talk to us afterwards about Spite, about the Unsafe Space Tour. Hopefully next time we'll see you on an actual university <laughs> campus um, and we'll be hanging around a bit for a, um, if any of you want to talk. So see you at the next one. Thanks so much. Let's talk about it now. Yeah. <laughs>